listening to the Wide Japan podcast with Michael Tang. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Wide Japan podcast. Every episode, I interview a new guest who lives in Japan, starting with probably the most asked question for all foreigners living in Japan Why Japan? It's been raining a lot lately in Japan as it is the rainy season, and I love the rain while I'm inside, but I absolutely hate it while I'm outside. Being from California, I don't know if I can ever get used to the amount of rain in Japan, specifically during the rainy season. Anyways, if you enjoy the podcast, please do the usual, such as liking the podcast, subscribing to it, sharing it on your social media or other platforms. Anything you do would be super appreciated. Let your friends know that they can find us at widejapanpodcast.com. If you would like to support us financially through Patreon, any amount would help tremendously and is very much appreciated. Everything will be reinvested directly back into the show so we could grow and improve. Please visit us at patreon.com slash widejapanpodcast. Again, that's patreon.com slash widejapanpodcast. Today's episode is with a well-known public figure, Peter Barakan. I met Peter a few years ago during my second time studying abroad when I was an intern at NHK World. I joined him on a few location shoots here in Tokyo and it was such an amazing and terrific learning experience for me. Peter is most known internationally for his work on the NHK show Weekend Japanology, which then became Begin Japanology and is now Japanology Plus. Domestically, he's known as a radio DJ and broadcaster. He hosts several shows on a number of radio stations and has been working in the industry for over 40 years. Originally from London, Peter has lived in Japan for 46 ish years and built his entire career around the music and radio industry here in Japan. And he's written several successful books in Japanese about music. In today's episode, we talk about his unintended plans on studying Japanese, moving to Japan, the cultural and technological differences between Japan and the rest of the world, and so much more. Unfortunately, we also had to record this episode outside again, but I hope you won't notice the background noises too much. With that said, here is part one of the two part series with Peter Barakan. Welcome to the show, Peter Barakan, to the Wide Japan podcast. Thank you. I should first of all probably say that we're sitting outside on a bench in a street, and there's going to be people going by, cars going by, maybe some trucks going by, all kinds of extraneous noise. So bear with us. Today we're out here in j i u g a o k a which is a very nice part of Tokyo, I would say. The last time I was out here was maybe a couple years ago, and I just remember it being such a nice area to, to be in. And I'm surprised to hear that you live. Somewhere within this vicinity. It's, it's a really nice area. Right. I've been living within walking distance of here for, wow, nearly 40 years. 14 years. 40 years. 40 years. Nearly, yeah. Wow. It'll be 40 years next year. So, Peter, as you know, the name of the podcast is Why Japan.、Mm-hmm. I normally start the show by asking the guests why Japan, and we kind of go into a lot about why they, they decide to come to Japan, what the story is about. But I really want to focus more on why you ended up staying in Japan. Because you coming to Japan is such a small fraction of your history compared to my other guests. You've been in Japan for 46、yeah. years now.、Mm. So you've been in Japan longer than almost twice of my lifetime. So, for some of my viewers who may not know who you are, could you just give them、mm-hmm. a brief introduction on who you are and what you do? Okay.、Uh, my name's Peter Barakan. I've been living in Japan since 1974. Most of my life here has been spent in the music industry. My primary work gig is as a radio DJ. I know that you originally from the UK、mm-hmm. and you attended University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS. That's right. And you majored in Japanese.、Mm-hmm. Why exactly did you choose Japanese? Was there a particular moment in your childhood that made you want to study Japanese? There's not a very good reason, actually. Back in my day in Britain, a university education was free, unless you were very rich, which we weren't. So I opted to try to get into university rather than going out and joining the workforce at the age of 18. Having said that, I didn't really know what I wanted to study. I knew that I enjoyed studying languages. I'd studied Latin and ancient Greek for seven years at school. I wasn't particularly a very keen student. I mean, I have enough intelligence that I can learn anything if I put my mind to it. But I wasn't the sort of person to say, OK, a y I'm going to go and study this and get really gung ho about it. It was more a point of finding something that I would find interesting to spend three to four years doing in college. 
I said, OK, I'll do a language. And then it became an issue of finding which language. And I really couldn't make up my mind. I didn't have any particularly, particularly good ideas about that. So it was kind of not exactly flipping through a book, but kind of going through all of the languages I could think of and saying, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? And the answer to most of them was not really. And then for some reason, I was having a conversation with my mother one time. And we were going through all these different languages. And I was saying, no, not that one, not this one. And then Japanese came up and I said, hmm. And to this day, I really don't know why, but it just kind of rang a bell in my head. And I thought, you know, that might be interesting. What did I know about Japan? Next to nothing. I didn't know anything about the language at all. On the other hand, Chinese had come up as an option as well, and I'd said no. For some reason, the sound of Chinese didn't appeal to me aesthetically. For some reason, I didn't know anything about Japanese, but I guess the fact that it, I said, hmm, that might be interesting, means that I must have had some kind of an idea of what it sounded like. I can't think why, because I didn't know any Japanese music, I'd never read any Japanese books. Did you even have any encounter or experience with Japan up until this point? I think I might have seen one movie. So it was really just, I want to study a language, let's talk about what languages are out there, and this one just kind of felt right. Yeah, and I'm a fairly impetuous person at times, so once I said, okay, I'm going to do that, I will actually move into action mode. In Britain, other than Oxford and Cambridge, all of the universities have one central clearing system. So you get a form and you can write in from one to six the courses you want to apply for in different universities. And you just send the form in, they send your applications out to all of the universities you've applied to, they will then get in touch with you to come for an interview, and it all proceeds from there. Now, I was potentially able to fill in from one to six, but I actually only wrote in number one, Japanese at SOAS, and number two, applied for something completely different at another university, but I, I ended up not even going for the interview for that one. So, in essence, I was putting all of my eggs into one basket. Now, this is back in, I mean, I made my application in 1968 because I was finishing school in 69. In those days, Japanese wasn't a popular course. In fact, when I started in 1969 at SOAS, the maximum class size was 15, and my year, they got that maximum size for the first time ever. Up right. until then, I think they'd only be typically been getting a about half, seven or eight people a year. That was the extent of students interested in studying Japanese. Now, when I finished my course in 1973, things had changed considerably. I remember some of my father's relatives, when I said I was going to study Japanese, said, wow, that's a bit weird. When I graduated, they, they were saying, well, you're ahead of your time, as it were. When you selected Japanese to study, did you have in mind, I think a lot of people these days who select a major to study in, it's not so much of what do I feel like studying, but more of what I should study to get a job. And no, there was nothing of that at all. So I, were you not afraid of possibly graduating with a degree in Japanese and not doing anything related to Japan? or I didn't have any ideas at all about what, what I wanted to spend my life doing. Mm -hmm. At the age of 18, I think very few people did. Yeah. Um, even now, probably. In the UK, anyway, I mean... In Japan, university students start sussing out potential jobs in their second year, I think. Yeah. And then they're going for interviews and stuff in their third year. Yeah. Nobody would have dreamed of doing that back in my day. I mean, even my daughter, went, who went to a, a British university just recently, well, 10 years ago, um, she didn't look for jobs until she graduated. Right. And a lot of people in England are still like that. In my case, Japanese was purely something that I thought might be interesting to spend some time doing at university. What I was going to do after that, I had absolutely no, no ideas at all. So after I graduated was when I first started to think about jobs. What level was your Japanese at when you graduated? Because I know that for me personally, I graduated with a Japanese degree as well, but compared to my fellow classmates, I think our Japanese speaking ability or language ability was not that high, where we could say, I graduated with a degree and I'm confident enough to communicate in Japanese or read or write in Japanese. What level were you at at the time? 
the reading and writing at, at the, the moment when I graduated, my reading and writing was fairly fluent because you know we'd been doing it week in week out for four years. Uh, we'd learned about fifteen hundred kanji. I was reasonably confident about that. Obviously, you know, you have to have a dictionary sitting next to you back back in those days when you used dictionaries, just in case. But I was reasonably confident. For speaking, no, uh, I was definitely not fluent. We had a conversation class once a week. But it was never enough to to really get fluent. And outside of the conversation class, you know, English students are not going to talk Japanese to each other. It's just too weird. Did at any point, or did you even have the opportunity to study abroad in Japan? There was the option to do a year in Japan, but you had to pay for it yourself, and nobody had the wherewithal to do that. There was one guy in the class who was older than all the rest of us. He'd already spent time in Japan. He had a Japanese wife. He had lived here. I think he was the only one. Uh, I don't think any of the others, you know, that were average student age, took up that option because it was just too expensive. So after you graduated, you went into the music industry, and then you moved into to Japan. Well, not immediately. I mean, I didn't have any plans to come to Japan when I graduated. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life at all. All I knew was that I was really interested in music and that I wanted to work in some relation to music. But back in those days, there was the evening newspaper in London. It was this big, fat thing, tabloid size. It must have had maybe a hundred pages, and the, the back half of it was all job ads. So I went out and I got the evening paper and. I was flicking through the job ad, seeing if I could find anything that was ready to music. And a record shop happened to be advertising. So, okay, that'll do for a start. And at the time, I didn't really have any idea to do after that. It was fun to begin with. After a while, I realized that it didn't really have a lot of future. Unless I was going to own my own shop, I was going to be stuck with a pretty low income level and working fairly long hours. I mean, you know, typically Japanese kind of hours, actually. And uh, it, I got into a mindset where, okay, this is really not going to work out. And I was starting to look for something else. And then there happened to be an ad in the trade paper that we always had in the shop one week, put in by a Japanese music publishing company. So I saw this ad. I thought, oh, Japan. Yeah, that's a possibility. And it was the first time that I ever thought about the possibility of working in Japan. So I thought, okay, why don't I write a letter and see what happens? So I got a reply back from then that. People from Tokyo were coming on a business trip, and I was set up for an interview. And to cut a, a longer sh story, slightly shorter, <laughs> well, I thought I probably hadn't got the job. And they called up, totally out of the blue, said, "Hi, this is Tokyo. Can you be here in ten days?" <laughs> and so you had ten days <laughs> to pick up your life and move it here. <laughs> and that was 46 years ago. 46 years ago. When you had those ten days, were you nervous about it? Did you have any doubts about it? Or was it something that you immediately just jumped upon? I jumped on it because the alternatives in London were not terribly bright. I didn't have a girlfriend. Uh, the job was really it didn't have much future in it. I didn't have a lot to lose, and they were offering a round trip plane ticket. If it didn't work out, I'd be coming back, and I would have had a, you know a holiday in Japan at somebody else's expense. So I figured, hey, you know, if I've got nothing to lose, let's give it a try. Being still 22 at the time, you don't really think about the future that much. I don't know, maybe you do, but I didn't. You're living uh, life day by day. Yeah, pretty much. And just kind of going with the flow. Really, really. And you, you know, for 46 years later, I'm still pretty much in the same kind of mindset. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned that you know after you graduated, you already felt pretty confident in your Japanese. You've written multiple books in Japanese since then. At what point in time did you feel your Japanese was good enough or that you had the situation where you wanted to write a book? I never wanted to write a book. I'd never had any ambition to write at all, actually. When I had my first job in the 70s back in the music publishing company, I, my work was related to copyright, so I had to write letters a lot in English to the other companies that we dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. The company also had different divisions where they published magazines, music magazines, and I was occasionally asked by the magazines to write record reviews in Japanese. I never really had much confidence, but, you know, record reviews are not very long, and it was something I was interested in. So I suppose I developed at least a slight facility for doing that. 
Before I wrote any books, I'd already been working in radio for several years. The first time I was asked to write a book was about soul music. I'd started working for NHK on their FM channel in the mid-80s, and this must have been like three, four years into that. I'd done a series of specials on soul music, which is one of the things I'm passionate about. And a freelance editor came to me and s suggested that I write a book about soul music based on the, the radio specials that I'd done. And no, I really don't have the confidence to write a book. You know, I, I really don't want to do that. But because of the subject matter, that was something that I had a lot of passion for. I eventually allowed him to twist my arm. But what happened was that instead of me writing the book, they interviewed me at length numerous times. And then somebody wrote up pretty much verbatim everything that was in the interviews. And a young guy, who's still a student at the time, he's a writer himself now, he basically put all of that material into primary book form. And then I went through it and edited to some extent what he'd written. Although with the deadline that we had for publishing the book, I wasn't able to give it as much time as I really wanted to. So the book came out under my name, but when I went back to it and read through it, it didn't sound like me. So I, I wasn't totally happy with the book. I mean, the book was very well received. The guy who wrote, who wrote the first draft was actually a much better writer than I am. So um, the quick answer is that no, I never wanted to write a book. And the, the only reason I ever did was because I had my arm twisted. You're mentioning a little bit about the music and radio industry. You've been working in it for a long time now. How has the radio and, and music industry changed in Japan from when you first started until now and particularly with the change in technology where people are listening to more podcasts or using apps like spotify or apple music where they don't need your traditional radio how is that like in japan before back in the 70s or 80s and how's it like now and does it have a future wow I read a whole book about that one i started doing radio in 1980 in those days, there were very few radio stations. Uh, the airwaves were very tightly controlled by the Japanese government. They still are, although there's more stations now. When I started doing radio, in Tokyo, there was NHK, which is nationwide, and there was FM Tokyo, which was the sole commercial station in Tokyo at that time. And that state of affairs continued until the second half of the 1980s when they deregulated the airwaves slightly. Anyway, when I, when I first started, there was FM radio and there was AM radio, and they were very different beasts. AM radio was mainly talk, and if they played music, it would be Japanese music. FM radio was much more music-oriented, and the music they played was generally Western. That started to change about 10 years later on. Around 1990, what is now called J-pop started to appear. So you had singers and bands who'd grown up listening to Western music and had absorbed it much more than the generation before them, were able to create music which had a groove that was pretty much close to authentic Western music, but they were singing Jap Japanese lyrics. Mm. So people started hearing this music on the radio because the words were in Japanese and it was because it was more accessible to them, they all went for it in a big way. And J-pop very quickly became the most popular type of music. Compared to other styles like jazz or... Or anything else. J-pop became the big thing on the radio. And once it became big on one station, all of the other stations started playing the same thing. This is the big difference between radio, say, in the U.S. and radio in Japan. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., you have different stations doing completely different formats. Right. They this don't one's hip-hop, that one's pop, this one's rock. The top 40, talk radio, news, you know, you name it. Right. In Japan, basically, everybody's doing the same format, and they all sound pretty much similar. It's something that most Americans would just shake their heads and say, why? Right. But because J-pop became so popular, Western music got pushed out. The only exceptions to that rule, perhaps, are NHK plays a lot of different kinds of music. There's a lot of different types of shows, and they don't have commercial pressure either. And then there's Inter-FM, which I've been working for almost continuously since it started up in 1996. Inter-FM was set up 
originally to serve the foreign population in the Greater Tokyo area. For the first two years, all of the shows were in English, all of the, all of the music was uh, Western music. However, they discovered very quickly that it, with that format, they couldn't get much advertising. Right. After a couple of years, they started bringing in Japanese pr- uh, presenters to work with the English speakers. And gradually that became only Japanese presenters. And although the music was all Western for, for slightly longer, eventually they realized that they couldn't fight the J-pop thing. And it was too strong. Yeah. You'll find very little Western music on Japanese radio these days. Mm-hmm. The way Japanese radio is set up, generally speaking, okay, you have live shows which might be longer, like two, three-hour shows, especially in the middle of the day. A lot of the programming, though, is pre-recorded and at, at the... At the outside, maybe one-hour shows. You have a lot of like thirty-minute shows, even fifteen-minute shows, ten-minute shows, and typically they will try to sell the shows to one sponsor. And the sales departments in the radio stations will bend over backwards to try and please the sponsors. But you'll find a lot of talking and a lot of commercial time, and very little time for music. Yeah, that's actually very interesting that you brought up there. Is that a lot of radio shows in Japan seems to be less about the music, right? Which, again, from a Western perspective, it's almost the complete opposite. Exactly. Yeah, and that's a sales-driven format thing. On the other hand, the sponsors, of course, are very pleased with that because they get their message across. Right. For the listeners, it's boring. Um, I was involved in radio programming for just under two years. It didn't work out well. And I tried to go totally in the other direction. I I ended up making a lot of enemies within the company, and they didn't renew my contract. So it was was a failure. Was that because you fought that traditional system? You wanted to kind of bring a little bit something different? and I wanted to get get it back to being a listener-oriented format. I thought I had the station management on my side. They said they were on my side. Uh, it turned out that they weren't. So I know that in previous episodes that you've done, whether it be on TV or radio, you may have mentioned there's some aspects of Japanese culture that you might never be able to fully grasp or fully accept. Living in Japan for over 40 years and hearing somebody say that to me is a little bit scary because... A lot of people, they think they could get over things or they think that they could eventually become acquainted to it, but you never could fully become acquainted to it, I think, in many ways. What are, what are the things that you couldn't really fully accept and well, why? Um, you know, I think wherever you live, there are always going to be aspects of the culture that don't really jibe. I mean, if I was living in London where I was born and grew up, I would be equally dissatisfied with aspects of British culture. I, it's not necessarily because it's Japan. It, it, it may be because I'm fairly a fairly idiosyncratic person. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> I think everyone has some part of Japan. The shoe doesn't fit everybody. Sure, sure. No, I mean, there are lots of things I don't like about Japan. I'm just trying to think of some specific examples now. It's um, hard to think of the examples on the it, spot, right? Yeah, but when I mean, it happens, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, God, you know, I've been here for so long now, and I, you, you get fairly kind of philosophical about these things. In my everyday life, there's very little that I can't live with. You know, there are just stupid kind of minimal type things that just really annoy you sometimes. Something that just came into my mind now. When my kids were little, we used to go to a, a local park in the summer when it was hot. And there was a paddling pool, and the kids were really small. They couldn't get swim. So they'd go in the, the paddling pool and just splash around in there. And one time I went in. Um, I was just standing next to my kid. I had my sunglasses on because it was hot and it was sunny. And the attendant at the pool said, you, you need to take your sunglasses off. Because if they fall off, they could break and somebody could get injured. And those are the sort of petty rules that you have to deal with. I mean, that's just a, one single example, but there's all kinds of really petty rules like that, which I'm sure you'll find in other countries as well. Yeah. It does seem as if Japan always has this, oh, we have to prepare for the worst case scenario for this tiny, minute situation that may never, ever happen, mm. but we have to do it anyways. Mm. You know, it's like the same thing with when you're on the train, waiting for the train, they always tell you, don't forget your belongings, watch mm-hmm. out for the doors, mm-hmm. watch out for your hands, you know. These that's, kind of things... That's because 
if something happens, they don't want to be held responsible. That's all it's about. Kind of bubble wrapping the situation prior to... Right, it's like, we told you. You're right. (laughs) And I think you'd find in the US, for example, they might not tell you up ahead of time, but but then in the US, everybody sues everybody. Right. Right. Which Which is why nobody ever says sorry. Well, I think people never apologize well, for stuff I, in the U.S., right? I Whereas think, in Japan, yeah, the fear, the fear of admitting all. guilt, right? Right. So you know, there are some swings and roundabouts in all countries. Yes, I mean, there are lots of things in Japan that sort of piss me off all the time, <laughs> right? But I've learned to live with them. I only worked for a corporation of any size for six years. After that, I worked for the management of the Yellow Magic Orchestra for another five and a half years. That was a tiny little officer, only about 10, 12 people. So it didn't really count as a corporation. And after that, I quit that job in 1986. Since then, I've been working freelance, which means, you know, uh, it, these days everybody has to work out of home because of the pandemic. Right. I've been used to working out of home for so long now that it's second nature. I enjoy it. I don't have to deal with inter-office politics or any of that crap, which means that my life is really stress-free a lot of the time. Very rarely do I have to get on a rush hour train. If I do, then I just, you know, I grit my teeth and, you know, it's 10, 15 minutes maybe. There's very little that I really have to put up with. I don't have to deal with officialdom very much because I've been a permanent resident for so long now. And there's all these things that really could make you kind of grate your teeth. But I really don't have to deal with a lot of them anymore. Thank God. Right. Basically, the secret that I'm hearing is be in Japan for over four decades and eventually you'll become used to and accustomed to the beauty and also the tragedy of, of the daily lives and the, for lack of a better term, the annoyances that you would experience. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great expression in Japanese, Ksareen. Have you ever seen the movie Casablanca? I have for one of my film classes, but it's, it's been quite some time. The very last scene in the film Humphrey Bogart and Claude Rains, the the police chief, who've been adversaries pretty much up until then, walk off into the distance. And I think think this could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And it's a little bit like that. You know that there's a lot of things that you really don't have in common, but you're going to learn to have a beautiful friendship anyway. And that's how you would say your relationship is with... With Tokyo. I've lived all of my life in Japan in Tokyo as I lived almost... I mean, in fact, I lived all of my life in England, in London. I would hesitate to say that I know a lot about Britain. I know a lot about London and I I know a lot about Tokyo, although even Tokyo is so vast. Absolutely. And I spent almost 40 of my 46 years living in one neighborhood. There's a whole bunch of places in Tokyo that I know zilch about. It's amazing because it feels as if Tokyo, even though it's a city, and particularly if we're talking about even just the 23 wards, this section of Japan is almost like a country in of itself. There's 14 million people living here. Right. Kind of going into the workforce, being in Japan for so long, do you think that the foreign workforce in Japan has changed? I don't know particularly what the uh, hottest skill was back then, but it does seem as if recent years, the biggest ones are English teaching, specifically because of the Olympics, programming because of technology, and recruiting, which I guess looking for foreign talent that have the prior two skill sets that we were referring to. Mm. You know, it's really hard for me to make a comparison there because when I first came here in the mid-1970s, it wasn't that easy for foreigners to get a working visa. In fact, my own visa... I originally came on a one-month trial, so I was only on a tourist visa. And then the company decided they wanted me to stay. I decided I wanted to stay. I had to leave the country once to switch to a working visa. Right. It took about a month and a half, and apparently it was touch and go for a while, because at that time the Japanese government didn't really want companies to employ foreigners if the job could possibly be done by a Japanese. And I, I think they managed to get some strings pulled to get me my visa. Things are a lot easier now. There's a lot of people who do get in. What One thing that hasn't changed from the 70s to now is English teachers. It was always the easiest way to get a, a working vi- visa in Japan was to teach English because they were always, there was always a need for that. 
there's always been a market for Japanese people who want to learn to speak English. Why is that? Because they're brainwashed into thinking they need to have English skills. Do you agree with that? Not necessarily. In most places in Japan, people could get by very easily without speaking any English. These days, now that finally foreign tourism has taken off, although in, in the wake of COVID-19, God knows how it's, Where that, it's gonna that may go. change. Yeah. But, I mean, and the delay of the Olympics. That's well, a huge yeah, one. Well, you know, the Olympics... I don't think they should ever have had the, the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo anyway. Really? Um, after well, 2011 and the Fukushima debacle disaster, they call it a nuclear accident in Japanese. It's the only place they call it an accident. It's, it's known as a nuclear disaster anywhere else in the world. They're still suffering there. And there's a lot of money that should have been spent on rebuilding a lot of that infrastructure, not only for Fukushima, but the places that were hit by the tsunami as well. The people, the yeah. businesses. But there are some people who are still living in temporary housing, you know, and the Japanese government diverted all of their resources. 2013 was when they applied to get the 2020 Olympics and they got them. They got them because the government lied and told them that the Fukushima situation was quote unquote under control. It wasn't under control then, and it isn't under control now. That was a bald-faced lie, and the IOC accepted that bald-faced lie. And they gave them the, the Olympics because, you know, it's going to make them a lot of money. So anyway, I was one of those people that was dead against the Olympics coming to Tokyo anyway. I'm kind of glad that it looks like they probably aren't coming, although so much money has been put to waste on account of the Olympics that it's kind of victory if that but anyway as a result of tourism mind you i mean more than half of the foreign tourists coming to japan are chinese so japanese people need to be able to speak english to deal with them is a moot point right i was actually going to mention that earlier something i always point out to a lot of my friends and family and is that you know when japan says something like at least prior to, to COVID-19, every single month or every single quarter, or every single year, there's a new headline that says, Japan breaks the record for number of tourists visiting. From a personal anecdote, all of my friends in America want to visit Japan or everyone wants to come to Japan because of stories that they've heard about how clean it is, how beautiful it is. But it's very interesting because even though that every year the numbers of tourists who come into Japan have been record-breaking, if you look at the actual people coming into Japan, a majority of them are from mainland China. Mm -hmm. And then the other half, the other 50 or whatever odd percent, is literally everyone else in the world. Yeah, but mainly Asian, I would say, in terms of numbers. Outside of the Chinese, you've got Koreans, of course, you've got Taiwanese, who, again, account for a fair percentage. You've got people from Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of those people, and maybe not tourists so much as they. A lot of them are workers these days, or they're coming on student visas and then become joining the workforce. But anyway, um, the number of Westerners, people from from Europe and the U.S., are. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but, but it's not, not terribly high. Right, right, and it's interesting because I always make a joke that. Whenever Japan wants to, quote, internationalize or globalize, or, it's not that things should be made into English, if you look at the numbers. It should be made into Chinese, if anything. You can see it nowadays, I think, in a lot of places where the train station names might be in English, Chinese, Korean, sometimes even right. um, another language. But it feels as if having English as the central language... It's hard to say because it's been 40 years and it doesn't seem like Japanese people's English is, is any better than it was 40 years ago. Right, which is because most of the people who are learning English don't really have any motivation to improve themselves. Or they're desire doing, to learn it in the first place. Well, they're doing it because they think they, they have to. Either that or if, if they're kids because their parents have forced them to. And the way English is taught in schools is really boring and it's all test oriented so you know it's hardly surprising that people are not motivated to, sp to speak better English. People who are motivated are the people who probably want to work either in the hospitality industry, if they're working in tourism related, like the retail, you know those people obviously it is going to benefit them to be able to speak English, to be able to communicate with foreign visitors. Uh, for anybody else they probably don't need it 
unless they're a real fan of like movies or music or something. You know, really it, Western fan. Yeah. Then again, you know, if you go to the U.S., how many people in the U.S. speak any language other than English? I think it depends on the part, though. If you say the midsection of America, which is a huge portion, by the way, definitely I would agree. In the red states, let's say. Right, right. You're going to find tiny minority people are going to be able to speak any language other than English, except maybe if they're close to the uh, the Mexican border, they might speak a little bit of Spanish. In, In California or in New York or in some of those other... A little bit more diverse areas, areas yeah. right. So, yeah. But but even so, I mean, and not just America, even any English-speaking country. I mean, Britain's definitely. The vast majority of people in Britain, unless they're well-educated and speak a bit of French or German or Spanish, the vast majority of them are going to try to get by in English wherever in the world they go and really not make any effort to, to learn any language. Do you think that's a good thing or bad thing? No <laughs> way is it a good thing. I mean, if, if you're going to try travel, go to somebody's country and, you know, just even to enjoy your holiday. You know, it used to be in my day, people would, at the very least, they'd buy a phrase book. Right. And they try, sure, sure. try to learn, you know, numbers one to ten, right. you know, and sit, uh, well, nowadays hello, goodbye, just, thank you. Right. Now it's just Google Translate. Yeah. I think that technology, although it's amazing and beautiful, I feel like you're losing up culture and you lose and, a lot of that because of that app. I don't know how much you've used Google Translate. I, I use it quite regularly when I'm working on my laptop and I can't think of a word. I think, oh God, what what is that? I'll go to Google Translate and punch it in and I said, good Lord, no, that's not what it is. Right. And sometimes I don't know what it is, but I certainly know what it isn't. Right. And Google Translate is horrible. It just doesn't know the context. It's a computer where that it knows that but this it, means this, but it doesn't know that in this context, it means something completely different. So, I mean, if that's the level we're at, people should not be using that. The technology will get there, right? It's not like I could stop the advancement of technology. No yeah. one can. But yeah. I feel like using that technology, you lose a lot. You lose a lot of the feeling that's involved or sure. that cultural aspect that's involved sure. in being able to speak it yourself. Sure. And there's this kind of jump, at least for me, when I was studying Japanese in college, I couldn't speak any Japanese. Only until I came to Japan as a student and I had that epiphany moment where I suddenly became confident to try or confident to make mistakes and things like that was when I started to really, I feel, start to understand the culture much more deeper than just simply as a language. Because the language is only part of the culture. And being able to speak the language while understanding the culture is is lost when you have something that does it for you. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit weird to think how time has changed so much between back then and now. And how Japan has evolved or rather not evolved with that. You know, something that I talked about on my previous episode, Japan still faxes. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a weird thing for me mm-hmm. because I still sometimes don't know how to fax. I, I, I kind of learned through my dad, but I guarantee you my cousins who are half my age right now don't know what a fax machine is. I mm-hmm. mean, most of them don't even know what a pager is. Mm-hmm. People always say Japan's so highly advanced and we have bullet trains and we have, you know, you go to Shinjuku or Shibuya and you see all these, you know, it's almost futuristic. Kind of Blade Runner or Ghost in the Shell feeling futuristic Japan. A lot of anime kind of presents it that way. But in reality, Japan's also very behind in many ways. We still fax. We still do a lot of stale mail. Mm-hmm. A lot of paper. Mm-hmm. It's a very paper-heavy mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. It, it, but it's also interesting because, again, Japan is like leading in other aspects of technology. All the game consoles, the Nintendo, whether it be the handheld games or the Switch, PlayStation, all these big Different main- generations. The people who are making all that stuff are of a younger generation. The people who are holding on to that whole paper culture and the putting a you know a, your personal stamp or your company stamp on every document. Everyone needs to approve of it before it can be finalized. Right, that's that's another generation back. And when that generation changes and the people who are creating all of the digital stuff now are in charge of the companies, you'll find that all of this really burdensome paper reliance will eventually vanish. It might take another 20 years. Or maybe not. I mean, with, with COVID-19 now, because people are stuck at home and not able to go to the office, those things are actually being forced to change a little bit. Finally, the government is now getting up off its butt and the, the KDANRIN, the, the business association, 
um, they're issuing directives now to, to the companies to, you know, maybe we need to change this. Right. You know, you mentioned earlier that Japan takes a long time to change. This is kind of something that we all are familiar with. Japan is really slow with change mm -hmm. in many good ways and bad ways. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make a change too quickly, but you also, with some aspects, you kind of really did wish it would change faster. You've been in Japan for over 40 years now. What things have changed within those 40 years that at the time you were saying kind of similar to what you're saying now, which is in 20 years to 30 years, things will change. Hmm. In that time frame, what has actually changed that you thought would change and what things haven't changed that you thought would change? Japan was actually quite quick in adopting faxes compared with other countries, I think. They adopted it so quickly they never left it <laughs> in many ways. You know, there was a reason for that. Most Japanese people had never learned to type because they never had to use English. In those days, there were so-called word processors in Japanese, and people could use those, but Japanese typewriters, and have you ever seen a Japanese typewriter of the old not. style? Your mind would be blown. How, how does it look like in, in differently compared to a Western typewriter? It's a big field of kanji, and then you have this, as it were, the, the key. You move it horizontally and vertically, and you find the kanji you want, and then you press down. Yeah, so I mean, back in the day, it was only really specialists that could do typing in Japanese until they started bringing in processors which weren't exactly computers, although it was a kind of primitive computer, in a way, right. I suppose. I don't even know how those things were worked, actually. I never used one. But anyway, the vast majority of Japanese could, people couldn't type, so to them, email was totally useless. So what would they do? They would write out what they wanted to send by hand and fax it. Okay, that makes a lot it was, of sense. It's really simple. Right, you could, just, you could just write by hand, yeah, write why would I, hand. Why would I spend all this time with this yeah. giant thing or right. like, trying to learn how to type if I could just write in five seconds and fax it? Right, exactly. I was actually not one of the early adopters of fax machines, uh, but eventually I was writing columns for magazines back in those days. I didn't have a computer yet. This is in, I guess, the earlier part of the late 80s. I was writing everything by hand and faxing it to, to the editors, and that's what everybody was doing. What What about now? I mean, now people could generally type a little bit better. Oh yeah, Japanese people really type well now, especially the younger generation. What surprises me is that the people who are sending faxes now are not sending handwritten faxes, they're sending faxes of stuff that they've typed on a machine, printed out. Yes. And that's what I don't understand. It right. just doesn't make any sense. It does seem as if a lot of the procedures that would benefit or would make things more convenient from, I think, a Westerner perspective, it seems as if they just kept it along. It's like building a building, but instead of remodeling it, you just kind of slap on a new paint job. Mm -hmm. And then the process is still the same. People these days can scan and send over email and there's cloud systems and everything mm. like that. But they still do the patch, which is the, you know, type on the computer and fax it as opposed to just typing on the computer and right. sending it. I mean, for example, I work freelance, so I do odd jobs for a number of different people. I always have to invoice everybody for any job I do. What I do is uh, I make up an invoice on my computer. Ideally, I would just like to make a PDF of it and send it by email. With most Japanese companies, there are a few Japanese companies that will let you do that. Most of them won't. You either have to print it and send it by physical mail, or what they'll sometimes accept is you print it, put your stamp on it, reset it back into the computer and send the stamped document by email, which doesn't make any sense at all, except they, it has a stamp on it. Would they accept a digital stamp? They probably would. I don't have a digital stamp. Okay, I see. But if it's being sent by email, then anybody that wants to check it can just look at the record and they say, ah, yes, this came from this person on this date. There's a record of it. Yeah, exactly. So you can't falsify that, especially if it's a PDF. Sure. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. There's, there's no logic behind their not accepting that. And it, it's just these kind of very sort of deeply embedded customs that they just don't want to change. And that wraps up episode four of the Wide Japan podcast with Michael Tang. It was great talking with Peter and exploring his vast experiences in Japan. The second half of the podcast will be episode five, so look out for that. Again, if you could support us on Patreon, any amount would help and goes directly back into the show. Please visit us at patreon.com slash Podcast. You can also find us on Facebook or Instagram at Podcast. 
Special thanks to Manuel Sanchez for the podcast artwork. Visit him on Instagram at Art of Manuel Sanchez. I hope you tune in to next week's episode of the Wide Japan Podcast with Michael Tang, and I'll see you next time.